the situation needs to be dealt with from a policy perspective and an investment perspective. And the question is, what does that look like as we go forward? It's like we like to tell clients, you know, get long, buckle your seatbelt and hang on for the ride because ultimately higher prices are going to be needed to solve some of these issues. Welcome to Smarter Markets, a weekly podcast featuring the icons and entrepreneurs of technology, commodities and finance ranting on the inadequacies of our systems and riffing on ideas for how to solve them. Together, we examine the questions, are we facing a crisis of information or a crisis of trust? And will building smarter markets be the antidote? Welcome to our Smarter Markets Summer Playlist, where we're sitting down with our special guests midway through this momentous year in markets to talk about where we are and where we might be and need to be heading next. It's Beach Reading and a Podcast. I'm Dave Greeley, Chief Economist at Abex Technologies. Our guest today is Jeff Curry, Global Head of Commodities Research at Goldman Sachs. We'll be discussing why food and fuel prices are so high and what, if anything, we can do about it. Hello, Jeff. Welcome back to Smarter Markets. Great, Dave. Thanks, thanks for having me today. Yeah, really happy to have you kick off our summer playlist. And, you know, when I look at what's happening this year in the commodities markets, this feels different. When when you were last on Smarter Markets at the start of the year, you talked about the needed upswing in the investment cycle and a very bullish outlook for commodity prices. You were right. And in these past six months, a lot more has happened. Uh, you've been doing this a long time, Jeff. You and I worked together throughout the 2000s commodities bull market. But this feels different to me. Does this feel different to you? Oh, yeah. Very different. I think at the core of it really is the, the policy response. You know, it has created an environment that has unwound two decades of energy liberalization. You know, we've seen, actually, if there's anything it looks like, and I don't know, it feels like because I wasn't old enough back in the 70s, but it looks like what the 70s looked like. You know, you have windfall, profit tax, power price caps, you know, you know, the list goes on and on in terms of the similarities there in terms of the policy response. And so what that is doing is it's creating an, an environment that is likely to extend the higher prices and, and it creates an, an environment which discourages the investment. Now, why is that important? Because at the core of this story really is one of underinvestment. You know, Dave, you and I back in the 2000s, in fact, you know, you and I together coined the term the revenge of the old economy. The whole idea of that story was poor returns in the old economy saw capital redirected to the new economy. And it choked off the investment that would have been otherwise used to grow the supply base of the old economy. Another way to say it in the current environment is investors preferred Netflix over Exxon. Now, it was completely rational for them to do that because the returns um, were so high, but it went on for a decade. Oh, by the way, the similarities, and it's probably worth you know, going over this revenge of the old economy story, is it's apparent in each one of those previous commodity super cycles. You know, the commodity super cycle in the 70s started in 1968. What preceded it? The Nifty 50. That was the big new economy boom then. And obviously the one and I were together during the 2000s, it was preceded by the dot-com boom. In fact, so when we coined the term, the revenge of the old economy, and this time, you know, we have the, the, the fang boom. Now, what makes this cycle far more vicious, and it goes back to your, your first question, um, does this feel different to you? It is the policy response. Whether if it's, you know, ESG, you know, ESG was there when we talked, you know, six months ago, but the policy response, driven in part by, you know, I would argue, misguided environmental policy, has definitely made a underinvestment story that much more hostile to do new investment you know, coming in. So what are the conclusions for, you know, how is this different today? It means that this commodity um, super cycle and the underinvestment, particularly in energy, 
is going to be really difficult to overcome. Because let me ask you, how many people want to line up to buy energy, utility, and you know, you know, power companies, you know, share prices um, when they know that they face a potential um, windfall profit tax? But you know, it just doesn't stop there. I mean, you know, Juniper this week, in, you know, in Germany was down something like seventy percent. Um, because you know the policy has failed to create a mechanism for for them to be able to pass through the higher natural gas prices. What you know, given that Nord Stream One was shut down, you know, two weeks ago. But it illustrates that policy, you know, is creating an environment which is making it very difficult for these companies. Um, not only to, to do their day-to-day operations, but to be able to harness capital, to be able to make the investments that are necessary to solve this problem on a, on a, on a longer-term basis. So um, bottom line, this is a very different environment than what you and I saw in the 2000s. Yeah, and I'd love to dial in to you know what you're experiencing in Europe because you're in London, I'm in New York, you've been near the epicenter of the most recent energy crunch with the the energy, the natural gas power crisis that's unfolded in Europe. Here, our natural gas market has been more insulated from the sky high prices in Europe. But now in the United States, people here are experiencing gasoline prices over $5 a gallon, the highest inflation rates in 40 years as they try to take their own summer vacations. And for people who aren't close to the commodity markets, but are listening now that this is really impacting their lives, can you help them how to think about what's next, not just for energy, but for food and materials? Because I think Europe's been, you know, a little bit in the forefront of experiencing this right now. Well, let's start with the supply story, the revenge of the old economy. That story was set in motion going all the way back to 0809. Because coming out of that environment, given the uncertainty around future economic growth, future economic policy, investors became unwilling to carry long-term risk, meaning making investments in long-cycle CapEx. They preferred short-cycle CapEx over long-cycle CapEx. Another way to say it is they preferred iPhones over copper mines. Um, And as a result... You know, investment in the entire old economy, not just energy and, and, you know, things like metals and mining, which started to taper off around 2012. You know, it was everything, autos included, that we saw this, partially again because of poor returns. Now, when we think about the environment today, the demand story, obviously, given the policy response to COVID, is what exposed the severity of these supply constraints. So think about this. You had the revenge of the old economy already put in motion. So we had these supply constraints. And then along comes March 2020, we see a huge surge in demand. And that surge in demand, in turn, exposed the severity of these supply constraints. So that's kind of like in in a nutshell. But I want to dig deeper into this story. And to do that, I want to tie the events of 0809 to the events of today. And I want to start with, with a, you know, a broader statement. Commodity bull markets and inflation are solely driven by low income groups. I know that might sound, sound surprising, but it's, it's critical to this story. And I talked about it you know, last time I was on the show, um, but I'm, it's worth going back and summarizing because it's so critical to this story. When we think about commodity markets, you know, they're volumetric markets. And when we think about how do you quote one, it's like oil, millions of barrels per day. In contrast, financial markets like equities are notional dollar markets. We call them dollar markets. How do you quote an equity? Billions of dollars of market cap. So you know, when we look at a commodity market to be bullish, you just look at the volume of demand versus the volume of supply. If demand's bigger than supply, you're bullish. A equity market, um, you pump money into it, it's gonna be bullish, it's gonna go up. So I think you get the difference between the two. Now, what I wanna point out though, is when we think about dollars, what are the world's high income people control? They control dollars. This is important because let's ask the following questions. Can the world's rich create financial inflation? Just one guy by himself? The answer is absolutely yes. They just pump money into the markets and they go up. 
Can they create GDP growth on their own? Absolutely, yes. But can they create inflation or commodity bull markets on their own? It's numerically impossible. And the reason being is there's simply not enough high income people in the world to do that. Only the world's low income can create commodity bull markets and inflation because they control the value. That, that is a critical point here to understanding how we got here and where we're likely to go and why these policy responses I was just referring to are critical. Another way to say it, high income people don't eat that much more corn than the low income guy. They do through the beef thing because there's beef. So I think it, you know, it's not like they can control, they eat up 10% of the world's corn supply. So if the price of corn is going up, you know it has to be coming from new entrant of a low income person, whether they're consuming beef or something like that. And so I think you, you get the point there, the core driver of marginal demand increases in commodities, old economy goods, you know, as well as capital goods is mostly being driven by that low income consumer. So let's go back and let's ask what happened in 08, 09. Actually, before I do 08, 09, let's just so you see this point about volume mattering. Let's go to the 2000s. You can think about once China joined the WTO in 2000, it triggered a powerful outsourcing arbitrage between rich Americans and Europeans and low-income rural Chinese. And we think about the low-income rural Chinese, that's your volume I talk about. That's what created that bull market in the 2000s and inflation in China. How many of them were there? Four 100 million low-income real Chinese. That was, they got brand new paychecks and went out and bought stuff. Um, so that commodity super cycle was driven by that low-income dynamic I was just talking about. But now I want to, so you can see, it, and I, by the way, there is no exception to it. All periods of inflation, all commodity bull markets, always driven by low-income groups. So let's go back to 2008, 2009. What was the financial crisis? It was a subprime crisis, you know, lending too much to lower income groups. The term was redlining back then. What was the immediate response by governments on both sides of the Atlantic in October 2008? Cut credit extension to low income groups. So just cut their credit lines. The next thing, number two, through austerity, stop fiscal transfers. Number three was QE, which benefited high income groups over low income groups. In other words, we pulled the carpet out from underneath them. Demand collapsed. You can just see it in any data source. And it didn't come back up until guess when? March 2020. Why? Because you unwound it all. You now, COVID was a crisis of inequalities, which forced policymakers to deal with the disadvantaged groups. And as a result, as policy moved away from being focused on macro stability and now focused on social need, we basically recreated the environment that was conducive to lower income demand growth. And I can show you some pictures by zip codes in the United States and your head would spin how impactful it was. So that created that huge surge in demand. And by the way, it was global in nature and occurred at the exact same time. And that's the critical point. Why we're so short of this, and it happened everywhere exactly at the same time. And then you expose the severity of it. Now let's bring up, you know, what's going on in Europe more specifically. So you got the underinvestment story. Now, why is it so concentrated in Europe? It is because you know, Europe is very dependent upon wind power. And when we look at what occurred in the middle of last year, you saw a 20% drop in wind power generation in Europe. That's huge. Basically, it quit blowing in Germany. Now, given that drop in that wind production, you had to replace it with something and they went to the gas market. Because of this underinvestment thesis in ESG, as they went to the gas market, there simply was not enough gas. Um, and then that caused a spike in the gas prices. That was around September. Now, let's look at an observation. When did Putin start building up troops on the border of Ukraine? October of last year, essentially right after the spike in and when it was clear that you had an energy crisis going on in Europe. So this is an important point. Why am I bringing it up? Because every policymaker out there wants to blame the current environment on the Russian invasion of Ukraine. No, the causality goes the other way. 
the energy crisis in Europe then created um, the incentive for Putin to build up troops and try to take advantage of the situation and invade Ukraine. So I want to make sure that all, all of our listeners see that the causality goes the other way around. Yeah, every policymaker out there is trying to use it as the scapegoat for what they're currently witnessing. And then once you had the problems that develop in, in around the Russian Ukraine invasion, which by the way, is way worse than any military strategist or you know, whether it was the Americans, Europeans, or even Russia themselves, the situation has gone on far longer than what anybody anticipated. Ironically though, the impact that it's had on commodity markets is, is, you know, not nearly as great as what many would lead you to believe, which tells you that the underinvestment in this space due to misguided environmental policies and, um, you know, the revenge of the old economy is far bigger than the, um, the supply disruptions that are created by Russia. But so, the, you know, the one last point, you know, you're talking about, you know, energy you know, and, and metals. The metal story, it's a tiny bit different than, than the rest of them, and it has been a little bit asynchronous, is because China's a far bigger driver of, of metals. So it has the exact same story. Shortages happen in the metals. The difference is that you had the, the property crisis begin to ensue in, the, in China last year. Um, that then created a pullback in metals that when they saw the... Co- you know, the COVID related lockdowns, um, it became that much greater. I mean, the demand for metals in China between the property problems and the COVID lockdowns during April and May was down 10%. And when you're consuming 50 to 60% of the world's metals, um, that's huge on a global basis. But when we look at them, the environment seems to be improving in China. And if anything, China is employing the third largest stimulus on record. Um, so we're very positive on the metals. Um, and we think they're going to you know, rebound rather aggressively here in the second half of this year. You know, but I, you know, let's not dismiss that demand was really weak. One last point on food, because there clearly is a food crisis going on as well as you know, what's going on in energy. Let's not forget, you know, food is called a carbohydrate. Energy is a hydrocarbon. Both are very, you know, are, are in, you know, dependent and very much embody carbon. In fact, I'd like to point this out. The only two assets on your screen that are up year to date are carbohydrates and hydrocarbons. And when we think about carbohydrates, let's not forget that, you know, 50% of the 8 billion people alive today would not be alive if it weren't for nitrogen. Nitrogen comes from ammonia and ammonia is a hydrocarbon. I like to point out we're made of carbon and carbon's a relatively scarce source. The key here is using carbon efficiently. I'm not, there's a whole nother discussion I'm not get there, but you know, when we think about a lot of people, I think there's this food crisis going on. You know, it's not radically different than what's happening in energy and they all boil down to the same underinvestment drivers that cause that. So, you know, the situation on food was, well, exacerbated by Ukraine, because Ukraine was one of the largest wheat exporters. 25% of the world's wheat exports come out out of the Black Sea. So I'm not going to dismiss the Ukraine-Russia situation in food. While in energy, think about natural gas, really serious. And the Nord Stream flows were just you know, connected. Oil, not that serious. Wheat, really serious. And you combine that with the underinvestment thesis, which is why we have the shortages you know, in food there. But I think when we like looking about the big forces, I just want to summarize again, there's a lot to you know, take in, is you know, we have um, you know, the underinvestment thesis that stems back to 08, 09. COVID occurs, policy response to benefit the disadvantaged groups, huge surge in demand, exposes the severity of the supply constraints, prices rise, and then the one last stage of this is everybody told me that, you know, the redistributional story that came out of COVID, meaning redistributing wealth from higher income groups, to low income groups, was going to end with the pandemic. Let me tell you, it is not ending. Um, you know, you had California this week announce, you know, subsidies to lower income groups to deal with, you know, the food and energy crisis. And you also, you know, you've seen it in Europe with the you know, windfall profit taxes 
um, revenues being given to the lower income groups. So the story that created the initial spike that you know that you asked me to describe, I want to make sure everybody here understands it's still very much underway and if anything being reinforced by governments around the world. This is why I love talking with you, Jeff, about commodity markets because you're so good at explaining it and bringing it down to to a real level. And I think you wrote very succinctly in one of your recent reports that, you know, you, you can print money, but you can't print energy, food and materials. And that's, a you know, the volumes that are being pushed through. It creates the inflation that we're all we're all wrestling with. And, you know, you've given us such a good basis to think about what's happening and what might happen next. But I want to take it up a, an even uh, one more notch of difficulty for you, because one of the things that I've always found so intellectually fascinating about the commodity markets is that they sit right in that vital center of the economy, markets, policy. And anyone who listens to you for more than five minutes, you know, gets the sense that you're thinking about all those different systems coming together. And the commodity markets are both, as you've said, being influenced by what's happening in the economy, other markets, and policy in particular, but also influencing them. And I was hoping you could just share with us a little bit, how are you thinking about the feedback loops between policy, the economy, food and energy prices, now that we have the war in Ukraine, sanctions on Russia, high rates of inflation that you've been discussing are forcing central banks to really tighten monetary policy for the first time in a a very long time. And uh, oh, the stock markets just finished their worst first half of the year in over 50 years. Well, I'm gonna, you know, you know, go back to you know a, a point here that carbon, whether or not it is in the form of carbohydrates or in the form of hydrocarbons. By the way, wood chips are carbohydrates. Oil would be a hydrocarbon. Wheat is a, a carbo, you know, hydrate. Um, bottom line, one of those two groups, carbohydrates or or hydrocarbons, has powered our society is for millennia. Yeah, this goes back, you know, centuries, centuries of millennia. Yeah, whether if it's peat coal or, or, you know, wheat or oil, they always sit at that nexus that you're referring to. You, I mean, in fact, all of them come, let's think about the, the you know, the, the, the four big building blocks of society. You know, it's ammonia, steel, concrete, and plastics. All of those um, come from carbon. And let's not forget, and forget the importance of ammonia. Um, the nitrogen, you know, again, it goes into the fertilizers and, and half of the world's population wouldn't be alive today if it weren't for those innovations that occurred, you know, during the 50s and 60s with the Green Revolution. Um, so, you know, that's why these things sit at the center. You know, it, basically the ability for, you, you, could, you know, here's the way I think is most economists will tell you that they don't matter. They don't matter because they're too small of a share of, of growth. Turn that upside down and think about how much GDP is tied to one barrel of oil or one BTU of gas going into Germany right now, and they're finding this out. Then you go, wow, it's really important because it's a small share of GDP, but the amount of output tied to one BTU or one barrel of oil is massive. And in many cases, it's very difficult to substitute away as we're learning in Europe with the shortages in natural gas. And that's why um, they sit at that nexus between economic policy and the economy and, you know, the, let's say, you know, geopolitical risk. I just quickly want to talk about, you know, about uh, monetary policy, you know, and I'm just going to repeat what many of the central bankers, whether if it is, Christine Lagarde or Jerome Powell, they all make it very clear. Um, There's not a lot that they can do about these supply side factors, because I like to point out, raising rates and creating a recession or demand destruction are not a long-term solution to this problem. The only long-term solution to this problem is investment. And interestingly, when you look at what occurred in the 1970s, Volcker, you know, is the hero for solving inflation then, took rates up to 20%. He did so after a decade, let me repeat that, a decade of massive CapEx. In fact, that CapEx boom you know, started around 68 and ended around 1980 
was the biggest capex boom ever seen in the data in the modern history. Yeah, there was military in there because you had, you know, everything from Vietnam to a Cold War to, you know, energy to, you know, all of it. But I'm just going to ask you to think about the, the question. Was it the rate hikes that solved the, the inflationary problem or was it a decade of the biggest capex boom we've ever seen? I think I would put a lot of weight on that capex boom. Then you go, okay, when we think about that feedback between policy and you know, the pressures in these markets, was it a really good thing that we had an overheating economy during the 70s? Yeah, you may have had stagflation, but those high prices created CapEx and created a lot of investment. And was that investment instrumental in debottlenecking the system? Because the system got a free ride from essentially 1980, um, you know, all the way until the most recent time period. In energy, yeah, you had your shortages in the 2000s and that, that created... Um, shale, but it, it lasted a good 25 years um, after 1980. It wasn't until 04, 05 that we started having shortages again. So, um, you know, that, so what that's telling you is that it's a very fine line between raising rates too far to kill off in inflation and letting them remain too low, creating too much inflation today. And so, you know, then you throw in, you know, the, the war in Ukraine, it makes it, you know, much more difficult in terms of, you know, threading that, threading that, that needle through that. Um, but I think, you know, the, the, the key, you know, the key message here is, you know, when we look at, you know, policymakers, they do have the capability to deal through, you know, wage inflation. That's not my expertise in core inflation. I'm not going to go there. But the one thing they don't have control over is that gap between core inflation and, and the headline inflation, which is part of the reason why they drop it out. But I will say this, you know, the policymakers on the fiscal side are making life really difficult for the central bankers, um, you know, through, through the policies that are, that are being implemented because they discourage the investment and they increase demand which just creates a, you know, much more, you know, hostile market. But I think, you know, you know, I think one of the, you know, the key point there is really thinking about, you know, how important these are in terms of, of allowing growth to happen, whether if it is food in the emerging markets or natural gas in places like, like Germany. And while they're taken out of the, you know, core inflation measures and they, they, you know, sitting in the uh, headline inflation numbers, I think, you know, the key thing and key metric you need to be paying attention to is whether or not we see CapEx flow, whether or not that investment can get to these resources to, to develop them. And think about any, you know, Fed-induced recession or demand destruction is being an impediment to the longer-term solution. And this is why we'd argue this is likely to take a decade. One thing it's, it's interesting that I've learned since probably the last time we talked, Dave, is why these super cycles take 12 years. Because the one in the 70s started in 68 and ended in 80. Um, the one in um, the 2000s started in 02 and in, ended in 14. Both were 12 years. Here's why I think it is the case. And I picked this up by looking at, you know, some of the best hedge fund managers I know out there that trade this stuff. And they had a hard time raising money. And I try to dig down to why is it the case and discovered, you know, in talking to the asset allocators is that their clients don't want this stuff. They don't want energy. They don't want metals. They don't want any of this. And one of the key reasons there are three reasons they don't want it is the first reason is a history of bad returns. Let's not forget two years ago, oil prices were negative. The second reason is the volatility is too high. It's all over the place. The third reason was ESG. Now I asked, what will it take to get over reason number one? Meaning what will it take for allocators to want to give capital to, to the space and chase what I think are great returns? By the way, did I, I don't maybe repeating myself. I make sure everybody heard I say this. The only two commodities that are only two asset classes on your screen that are up year to date are hydrocarbons and carbohydrates. They've outperformed everything for the last two years. So it's amazing why they're not getting capital. You know what the answer was? The only way this sector is going to get capital is if it can prove to the world it can generate positive returns for three years running. We're about 20 sub months into those three years. We've got another year to go. Now, if you assume it takes 
three years to get a track record to get money in the space. Now I know why it's a 12 year cycle, three years to get a track record, then three years to deploy the capital because you can't deploy trillions of dollars of capital into a sector overnight and expect it to be absorbed in like five months. It's going to take, takes about three years. Then once the capital and people and everything's put in places, then the following three to five years, you de bottleneck the system. Now look at the 2000s, Dave. This is what I found. Okay, bull market started in 02. You and I were there together when it started. When did the capital flow? It started flowing in 05. After, after three years of a spectacular bull market, they finally jumped in. And then when they jumped in, and in fact, I, I remember you know, we were sitting there and you coined the term um, long-term shortages create near-term surpluses. When they bought into it, they had to wait for three years. And then the equities ripped back into the oil curve, ripped, everything went up. And you had cost inflation because you tried to throw trillions of dollars into the system and it got bottlenecked. And then finally, you know, years, call it seven through 12, you start to get real investment. Think about when did the shale just say it was like Independence Day of 008. I think Ryan Singer wrote a piece called Independence Day of 08 when the shale gas started coming out. And that's basically year seven through 12. We de-bottlenecked it such that by the time you got to 14, um, the system was, you know, in surplus. But I think, you know, the big observations I've had since we've last talked really is this idea that. The sector needs a three-year track record before this capital is going to flow. And you know, I think going back to tying it in with policy, policy is going to make it that much more difficult for that capital flow once it does begin to flow. Yeah. So I guess, you know, heading back to the beginning, what's not different this time is that over the long term, it always goes back to investment. And people really need to keep that in mind. And you know, you and I are University of Chicago guys. And for me, if I if I can't think of something in terms of supply and demand when it comes to economics, I figure I probably don't understand it. And you know, the point of if you look at what happened in Europe, you know, with the energy transition, trying to move away from using as much carbon, whether it's you know clearing land for more agriculture, whether it you know and creating food, or whether it's you know using fossil fuel energy, you know, if you cut the supply of something but you don't cut the demand, prices go up. And so if we're trying to get through an energy transition where we're not finding ways to reduce demand by finding other sources of energy, food, the things we need, the basics of life, you're going to have prices go up instead of prices going down. And you know, there, there's not really any way to get around that. And I'm really glad you brought up the point about the tightening of monetary policy. Because, you know, often when you hear about it in the popular press, it's, well, the Fed's going to hike and that's going to cut demand. But what is, it's not really cutting consumption, it's cutting investment. Like we'll talk about, oh, it'll cut, you know, home buying and home building and it'll cut cars. But, you know, to an economist, those things are really more investment than immediate consumption. And so the same way that it cuts investment in new houses or durable goods like cars, it can also impact the investment that we need to get through these supply problems and get to a longer term, you know, more affordable prices for these basics of life. And, you know, I guess one of the other things that hasn't changed since the 2000s has been that there's a lot of policy responses being proposed by governments and politicians. You've alluded to a few of them, you know, gas tax holidays, strategic petroleum reserve releases, blame the oil companies, blame the speculators, put caps on natural gas prices, uh, particularly coming out of Russia. And I expect you believe that most of these proposed policies will will do more harm than good. Maybe you could walk people through quickly why and like, is there something, it's probably the more important point, is there something policymakers can do that you think would be helpful? Well, I'm going to answer what can policymakers do that could be helpful. Number one is just create an environment that's conducive to investment. That, however, in the current context is a really tall order to ask because you got to tell the constituencies, we're going to go out and subsidize oil companies. By the way, in the 70s, you did. You know, maybe it's getting bad enough in Europe where, um, you know, that, that those kind of thoughts, you know, aren't completely inconceivable at this point. And by the way, I think this past week when Macron slid, did the hot mic slip with Biden about, you know, OPEC being out of spare capacity, you know, there was a lot of political reasons he could have been doing that, whether it was to get the, you know, the green pressure off the back or potentially incentivize Biden to want to 
um, you know, um, be loud and trying to get the incentives for the shale producers to ramp up production. But I think the key point here is that policy needs to be focused on solving this problem. And solving this problem is creating some type of, of incentives to get production up. And by the way, the, it, all of these things are all rolled in, in, into one. We need clear so that people know what the policy is and consistent. It can't be all over the place. It's got to be consistent. It may not even be the best policy. It can't change on you. That's the key point. And it needs to be globally coordinated because these are global markets. Once you get that, then you can start to solve these, these problems. Um, you know, a lot of it's just taking the uncertainty out of it. That's all they need to do. Can't, even if it were medium, okay policy, it, you know, it just can't be policymakers kind of indicating there might be okay to invest in hydrocarbons near term, but not long term. Well, no, you can't have that kind of policy. That's exactly the type of policy that is that will discourage the investment here. But I think, you know, the the key point here is creating that policy is really difficult in the current environment. I know I can't, if I were a policy, I can sit here on this podcast and talk about, yeah, the right answer here is, you know, create tax breaks in case oil prices collapse um, to oil companies. That's not going to go over too well. So it needs to be wrapped up in a general policy statement that goes, think about managing decarbonization or energy transition such that create well-defined targets about how we're going to bring down you know, uh, bound emissions. When, by the way, in, you know, potentially even back off on the how to do the, you know, the green investment. You know? But I think the key point is we don't have that policy. ESG has arisen because those types of policy frameworks simply don't exist. Um, and, you know, I think going back to, let's go over why they don't exist. I think that, that's an important point here. One of the key reasons why they, they don't exist is the three big emitters. Think about three blocks, America, Europe, and China. They emit 66% of, of, you know, overall emissions. And when we think about, you know, the, you know when we think about, um, the three blocks. Let's say Europe can pass a carbon tax. Um, it has its other problems with discouraging investments. I'm going to take that off. Let's, but they're very. They got the right direction in, in carbon pricing. China would get there, but China wants it instead of going to one and a half degrees. They want to go to two degrees. Why do they want that extra ten years? And there's a lot of political reasons they want their extra ten years. But that's the the problem between China and Europe and, and the U.S. The problem with the U.S. is passing a carbon tax is incredibly difficult, you know, for, for America. Like, you know, no taxation without representation. 250 years ago, back to the Boston Tea Parties. This is going to be a tall order to ask. Really, really difficult. But if you can get those three groups together, we're going to end up, you know, we can get to that point where we can start to create the globally coordinated, clear and consistent type of policy that can start to address these issues. Because the only way you can actually say, hey, let's help out in getting the investment on the hydrocarbons, because the point is you can't subsidize it forever. You know the energy transition is going to happen. You don't want to do some long cycle thing. Um, you know, you got, it's, got to, it's just got to be defined. They know, OK, if I do this short cycle, I can get the returns out of this because that's when it's going to go down. Then it's, you start to create a mechanism in which you can, you know, create the transfers to get the investment to happen on the green side. And, it, you know, no way to say it's rebalancing the carbon investment with the green investment and doing it in a way that is sustainable on a more longer term basis. But I think, you know, going to, you know, the failure with, with the Americans is how, you know, because I think you get the Chinese on board. How are you going to get the Americans to pass, you know, policy? Now, I unfortunately look at history. When did Nixon sign into law the Clean Air Act Amendment, 1970? Um, it was because Lake Erie was on fire. You know, I like to call it the Lake Erie moment. Unfortunately, we probably got to get to a Lake Erie moment before the, um, you know, the Americans are going to pass that, which means we're a long ways away from, you know, getting that, you know, that, that policy response. But, I, did, I you know, in terms of, you know, what have we done more real? recently, you know, what we've done more recently, the answer to your question, is it counterproductive? You know, the answer is um, most likely yes. Why? If you do windfall profit taxes, that discourages the investment. But what are they using the windfall profit taxes to do um, to provide subsidies to consumers to buy more energy? 
I think most of the people on this on this podcast can understand that that's going to create higher, not um, lower prices. You know, whether if it's a tax holiday in the U.S., you know, that's just going to lower the price of gasoline and create more demand. It may do the federal all-in price may go down 16, or was it 18 cents um, if they did that. Um, but the, the demand would increase significantly, putting more upward pressure on the overall underlying petroleum prices. Um, and then, you know, the, the SPR releases, um, you know, that's been great recently. It put a cap on prices, but um, it discourages investment and it ends in November. So there's a lot of question marks that are that, that are being, you know, created here. I saw, you know, I, I think, you know, you know, the answer to your question, you know, what we're doing at this point, you know, this is the knee jerk reaction, like what we saw in the 1970s. You know, the, the question is, what can they do? I'm going to go back to just leave the message here. It needs to be clear. It needs to be consistent, not changing. They need to be well-defined um, and it needs to be coordinated. You get those three ingredients right, it could be mediocre policy and it's going to do a lot to solve this problem. Anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. No, that's great. And as you said, like that's a, it's a tall order, but I like the idea that uh, mediocre, that's clear, consistent and globally coordinated is a lot better than the 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 uncertainty and flip-flopping that we're more likely to see. And as you said, because it's a tall order, you know, the policy response that we will see will probably be different from that. And given the realities of politics, you know, that probably means things get worse before they get better in terms of affordability. And I'm curious, you know, just briefly, how do you see energy, food, and metal price dynamics developing over the next few years? And I really wanted to bring up, where does gold fit into all of this? Let's, let me answer the question on food and energy first. You know, more I think about it is that, that food and energy story, there's so much more tied than I ever, you know, I actually, you were in 06, you were the one doing the original work on the biofuels on our team. Um, and that's one of the areas where you do see that, that connection. But the one that, you know, the, that I've actually more and more, have connected food and fuel together is this ammonia connection, um, you know, through the fertilizers and through, um, you know, even the cost of, you know, the, the tractors and everything and the energy to, to, to produce it. So those two are very much tied together. Both of them are facing very severe shortages right now. And when we look at, you know, the current inventory levels, very low, Yes, there, um, you know, there still is OPEC spare capacity out there, you know, you know, a little you know, near 1.5 million barrels a day. I think the key point is this is likely to be exhausted as we move towards the end of this year, which then starts to create a much tighter market. You know, policy has done one thing right now is just focus on keeping the price lower. That's why we're still trading in that $110, $115 a barrel, $115 barrel range is because policy is so focused on the price situation. But I think when we start to look out towards the end of this year, you know, the, 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 you know, the situation starts to become explosive to the upside. And then food, you know, a lot of it's dependent upon the weather this summer. You know, do we get a, you know, a, a positive yield response or do we get a hit? So far, the weather's been positive, but still you're talking about, you know, beans in the teens, which, you know, historically was, was you, know, you know, unthinkable. So, but, you know, in terms of looking at, you know, what, you know, eventually the policy situation is not constructive, which means, these, you know, whether or not it creates a, you know, uh, an environment which creates a Lake Erie moment or whatever you want to call it, like I discussed before, the situation needs to be dealt with from a policy perspective and an investment perspective. And the question is, what does that look like as we go forward? So like, like we like to tell clients, you know, get long, buckle your seatbelt and hang on for the ride because ultimately higher prices are going to be needed to solve some of these issues. Turning to the metals and gold, you know, I, well, last time we talked, you know, let's go back to, you know, my first experience in here on this, which I think was in like November of 2020 on Smarter Markets. You know, there I lumped it all together. We talked, uh, you know, earlier this year, um, the metal story started to diverge. The metal story now, I think, is very, very different. Why? One is what's going on in China. And then number two will be the green capex story that begins in earnest in 2023. Let's start with what's going on in China. You know, I think the key point there is that the situation in China 
is that we have um, a property slowdown occurring on top of the zero COVID policy. And this created what I say is a recession for commodity markets during uh, you know, the April, May time period of this year. And, um, and in metals, it's a 10% decline in demand. Energy demand down was down you know, 2.5% globally. These are big numbers. And the fact that we're still sitting at, you know, $8,500 copper and $115 crude, given that is pretty impressive. Everybody's going, where's the recession? It's coming, it's coming. Newsflash, it happened in the commodity markets when China went through that time period. Now, what that did, create a really strong dollar. So fundamentals of copper are tight, despite all of that. You know, the situation with gold looks like it'd be fabulous. Why aren't gold and, and copper in the doldrums? Main reason why is, is a very weak C and H in the Chinese, Chinese yuan and a very strong U.S. dollar. You know, it's one thing you know, we like to argue is oil granger causes dollar, dollar granger causes um, metals prices, and particularly um, base metal and precious metals. And so when we look at that drag it has created, it is real. But the demand weakness there, it's hard to say how, yeah, by the way, I just want to quickly um, make the point. Why is it a drag on, on metals and not energy? Think about this. Energy is a lot of fixed costs and very variable, very low variable costs. Think about, it. you know, you put a lot of fixed costs in to get the donkey going up and down, those things that go up and down in the fields. Um, you don't have any labor. In contrast, with metals, it's not a lot of fixed costs, but you have those big mining operations, lots of labor that go in and energy that go into um, you know, the miners, the truck drivers and everything. And so you can think of metals being in agriculture being high variable cost, low fixed cost, energy high fixed cost, low variable. Why is that important? Because these are dollar denominated assets. Fixed cost is always in dollar. Variable cost is always local. And so when the dollar is really strong, those variable costs drop. And that's why it acts as a drag on, on the underlying um, metals and prices, metals prices. And so when we look at, just take a picture of CNH, the Chinese one, the weaknesses, the experience is perfectly correlated with both copper and gold prices that act at the drag. But let me ask you this, is it the weakness in China that creates the drag on the, you know, on the commodity prices or is it the weakness in China that creates the strong dollar? It's the same conclusion. The only way this that gets better for the metals, whether if it's gold or if it's copper, is that you need an improvement in China. And again, physically, China is a big buyer, the world's biggest buyer of gold. Um, they like it for, you know, they buy gold bars when, um, you know, when things get, uh, you know, the risk begins to pick up. They buy it for jewelry. They're big, real, this is the real consumption for gold. It's not, you know, financial investment pure per se. It's actually real physical, unlike what the Americans do. So bottom line is when we look at metals prices, you got to keep your eye on China and, you know, the potential um, improvement there. Our base case is you got the third largest stimulus package um, and since the financial crisis in China right now. Um, Xi Jinping has his party Congress, I think at the end of October, early November, and he'll have every incentive to see a very strong economy going into year end. So we like metals from this point. Well, Jeff, thank you. You've given so much for all of us to think about today. And for myself personally, you've triggered so many memories. I'm now thinking about uh, the piece we wrote a long time ago called uh, Food, Feed, and Fuel. And it sounds like we need to add another F to that at some point for fertilizer. So thanks so much for being so generous with your time. Before I let you go, though, you know, for this, you know, I think of our Smarter Markets summer playlist as a type of beach reading, maybe for wonkier types, but beach reading in a podcast. And in that spirit, I'm going to ask each of our guests in this series, what is on their personal beach reading list this summer? So I was hoping you can kick us off. So what are you reading this summer, Jeff? Um, How the World Really Works. I think that's the title of it. It's by Vaclav Smell. And I, I highly recommend it to anybody that is struggling with how to think about climate change. You know, he really goes into just how important things like fertilizer are, um, how important concrete and steel and how they, how they make modern societies work. Um, and you also, you know, 
dematerialization is being driven by this whole data movement. Um, the world still can't function without materials. We can't go to a completely digital world. We still need steel, concrete, fertilizers, um, food, oil. And unfortunately, the production processes that are put in place in these things are critical to um you know, to creating those emissions. So it's a really difficult problem. And I really suggest people pick this up. You know, it's a relatively quick read and it really sheds a lot of light on just how difficult um, decarbonization is going to be. So thank you, Dave. I really appreciate, you know, the time today. Absolutely. Anytime. And how the world really works. Vaclav Smil is, I'll go pick it up today. Thanks so much, Jeff. Talk with you again soon. All the best. Thanks again to Jeff Curry, Global Head of Commodities Research at Goldman Sachs. We hope you enjoyed the episode. Join us next week as we continue our summer playlist on smarter markets with our next special guest. We hope you'll join us. That concludes this week's episode of Smarter Markets by ABAX. For episode transcripts and additional episode information, including research, editorial, and video content, please visit smartermarkets.media. Smarter Markets is 100% listener-driven, so please help more people discover the podcast by leaving a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or your favorite podcast platform. Smarter Markets is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Smarter Markets should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Smarter Markets are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or producer. Smarter Markets, its hosts, guests, employees and producer, ABEX Technologies, shall not be held liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on informational viewpoints presented on Smarter Markets. Thank you for listening and please join us again next week.